Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. everyone. Welcome to Constitutional Chats. I'm Kathy Gillespie, and we have got a great guest for with us today, uh, Professor Brian McClanahan. Janine Turner is not with us today. Unfortunately, she's uh, got another commitment, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and read Janine's bio anyway, because we are, we just are so proud to work with her and I want to tell a little bit about her. Actress Janine Turner is famous for her role as Maggie O'Connell in television's Northern Exposure. She's founder and co-president of Constituting America, which launched in 2010. She's still acting, but she's also actively teaching kids about the U.S. Constitution, having given over 500 speeches to classrooms across the country. And that's actually what she's doing today is making a Constitution presentation. I also want to introduce Tova Kaplan, who is our National Youth Director. Tova is a 16-year-old from Chicago, Illinois. She's a three-time winner of our We the Future contest. She's the National Youth Director of Constituting America and runs the Youth Advisory Board. She is passionate about inspiring young people to know and use their constitutional rights. Tova, would you like to say hello? Yeah, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, thank you all for joining us. Next, I'd like to introduce Jeanette Cranack. Jeanette is a former elementary school teacher, PTA president and operations director for Constituting America. Among her many duties, Jeanette handles all of our outreach to schools and school presentations. And along with Janine speaks to thousands of students across the country as part of our school speaking team. Jeanette, would you like to say hello and talk a little bit about how our listeners can book a speech? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about booking speeches in the new year. Uh, we pretty much have a handle on doing these speeches virtually. So if you have time to send an email to your students, teachers, or if you're a homeschooler, if you would like us to reach out and spend some time with your kids and teach them about the Constitution, go to our main page and you'll see uh, click a speech. There's a button there for it. Uh, we'll receive the emails right away and we'll get you on our calendar. I also wanna mention Dakari Chapman, who's gonna be joining us a little bit later. Jen Dakari is the other member of our, of our youth panel. And he is an 18 year old student from North Carolina. He's Constituting America's student ambassador, serves on our youth advisory board, and is a two-time winner of Constituting America's We the Future contest. Dakari is a working actor and can be seen in season two of Netflix's hit series, The Outer Banks. And that's actually where Dakari is right now. He's on the set of Outer Banks and he's hoping to get freed up in a little bit and is gonna pop in when he can. So we look forward to seeing Dakari a little bit later. I also want to thank Lisa Williams on our team, who is our media director and responsible for all this fabulous technology. Lisa can't say hello today because she's got something else going on in the studio. Besides this, she's doing double duty. So Lisa, we thank you for all that you do. Now, before we get started and I introduce our, our guest, Brian McClanahan, I also want to thank our sponsor, Dwayne Horner. Dwayne is a longtime friend of Constituting America, uh, and I'd like to just read a little bit from Dwayne's bio because it's just uh, very impressive, and we're just so fortunate to have him as part of our team. Dwayne is a, a key member of our leadership board. Dwayne's love of country and love of our U.S. drew him to become a part of Constituting America and its goal of educating America on the greatest gift given to us, the U.S. Constitution. 
Dwayne has been involved in all aspects of civic engagement. He's been an active in many campaigns. In addition to serving on the leadership board for Constituting America, Dwayne serves on the board of the Crockett Retreat Center to assist veterans and first responders by providing an opportunity to train with licensed horse therapists at a Texas ranch setting. Dwayne, we thank you for your sponsorship of today's constitutional chat and for all you do to make our constitution education programs possible. So now I'd like to introduce our guest, Professor Brian McClanahan. And the topic, as Tova mentioned, today is our last in our series of the Bill of Rights and You. Our title of, of this episode is Passing the Bill of Rights, James Madison Influences and Inspirations. And we are so fortunate to have with us today, Professor Brian McClanahan. Dr. McClanahan holds a PhD in American history from the University of South Carolina. He's the author of seven books, including The Founding Father's Guide to the Constitution, and is the founder of McClanahan Academy, an online learning experience geared towards homeschool students and lifelong learners. He has written extensively on the founding generation and the Constitution, and his work has been published at Town Hall, Daily Caller, Breitbart, Chronicles, The Washington Times, LewRockwell.com, and other online and print publications. You can find him at www.brianmcclanahan.com and www.mcclanahanacademy.com. And he's making a special offer today to anybody who's listening. You can use the coupon code BORDAY, that's B like boy, O-R-D-A-Y, BORDAY, and take 40% off his American Constitution course at McClanahan Academy. Brian is a regular contributor to Constituting America's 90-Day Studies. So welcome, Dr. McClanahan, and a big, happy Bill of Rights Day to you. We are happy to have you with us. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here, and I'm excited to be talking to a bunch of students. I think I hope we have a lot of students here, and uh, people that are really interested in the Constitution is one of my favorite things to talk about, so this is going to be exciting. I want to start because this is Bill of Rights Day, and I was asked to talk about uh, a little bit of the history of the Bill of Rights, also some of the things that maybe you haven't touched on yet in, these, uh, in this series, and I actually want to start with the preamble of the Bill of Rights. I don't know if, if you've covered that or not, but it's one of those things a lot of people don't realize exists. Uh, but the preamble to the Bill of Rights says, the conventions of a number of the states having at the time of their adopting the Constitution expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers that further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added. And I want to talk about that for a second. One of the reasons we have the Bill of Rights, of course, is because it's there to protect the liberties that Americans fought and died for, of course, during the American War for Independence. And as part of that Anglo-American tradition, I know Jeff Sessions got in a lot of trouble years ago when he said, we have an Anglo-American tradition, but that certainly is true. The Bill of Rights is an outgrowth of the Magna Carta of 1215, the English Bill of Rights of 1688, and of course, also George Mason, who wrote the first Bill of Rights in the American states in Virginia. And that's why George Mason is often called the father of the Bill of Rights. It was the Virginia Declaration of Rights that led to the Bill of Rights. But during this process of writing the Constitution, and of course, of ratifying the document, many people thought that the Constitution was going to create a central government that would be so powerful they wouldn't be able to check that government. And I think that there are some terms we need to use to be clear about what that government is. It's a general government, as the Founding Fathers called it, or a central government. Sometimes they use national government, sometimes they use federal government, but in reality, what they intended that government to be was a general government for general purposes. So if you have a general government for general purposes, that means that that government has powers that are expressly delegated. And if you look at the 10th Amendment, it talks about delegated powers. But there was, of course, a, a fear, a threat that the Congress and the president and the judicial branch eventually, which, of course, was at first only a Supreme Court, would abuse those powers. They would centralize power. So the uh, members of the, of the, of course, ratifying conventions, the states themselves, wanted to ensure that they outlined the restrictions on that general government. Now, when James Wilson, who was a very famous member of the founding generation, again, not someone that people, it's not a household name, but Wilson of Pennsylvania gave the State House Yard speech in October of 1787, he made clear that the 
central government or the general government only had the powers that were listed in the Constitution. But of course, the opponents of the document kept saying, well, this is not true. You're going to see the executive become a, a king. You're going to see the Congress pass laws that it has no authority to do. Wilson said, well, this, this can never happen because the powers that are delegated to the government or granted to the government is, is the term used. Those are the only powers the central government has, whereas the states have all the other powers. They reserve everything else. But that argument was falling on deaf ears. In fact, during the process of ratification, Massachusetts in particular made it clear that they would not ratify the Constitution without the Bill of Rights. So we had to have a Bill of Rights. And it was essential, it was a key to getting the Constitution ratified. And of course, after that promise is made in several states, the Constitution is ultimately ratified. Now, the argument against the Bill of Rights was always that if we do this, that, then you're actually admitting that the Constitution gives the general government powers that it did not have. And I think that's a very interesting argument. We could talk more about that if there's any questions about that. But when we get to this point of, of these amendments being added to the Constitution, James Madison takes up the task of then consolidating hundreds of proposed amendments. Interestingly enough, the amendment that often appeared first on most of the list sent to the Congress was what eventually became the 10th Amendment. They wanted to ensure that the states were not going to be cut out of this uh, of this government. So Madison consolidates all these things down. They get 12 of them, first 17, then 12. Madison actually wanted to include a different type of preamble. He wanted to weave the Bill of Rights into the Constitution itself, which was rejected. He also wanted to essentially create an incorporation amendment. Now, as we move forward in American uh, government, and of course, American court cases, the Bill of Rights have been applied to the states. Madison wanted to do that in 1791, 1789, 1790, 1791. And the founding generation rejected that idea because the states already had declaration of rights. They didn't think another, uh, another series of, of rights applied to the states was necessary. They thought that this would apply only to the central governments. So this is an interesting situation that we have in American courts now, you know, we just saw, uh, for example, the situation in New York where there was a, uh, an opposition to uh, the city uh, shutting down churches. This is what Madison said the central government sh that, that should not have been allowed because the central government should have a role in that. Of course, the founding generation said, no, this, the states already take care of these things. So this is an interesting back and forth that we get throughout American history. But Madison consolidates them down to 12. Those 12 get sent to the states. And two, are not ratified immediately. One becomes the 27th Amendment. The other is still hanging out there. And this is an interesting amendment. 10 states ratified it. It actually would have dealt with apportionment. And um, a lot of my students, when I talk about this issue, you know, if you look at the United States today, and people on the left and the right often feel disconnected from the general government because we have a very large representative ratio, 700,000, about 735,000 actually to one. So for every one person, or for every one representative, excuse me, there are 735,000 people that that representative uh, then is representing in Congress. The founding generation thought 30,000 to one was necessary for good government. Then they went to 40,000 to one and 50,000 to one in this proposed First Amendment. If that was put into effect, we would have a Congress of House of Representatives of 6,400 members. So that would be too big for a government to work properly. But on the other hand, you have to ask yourself if George Washington thought 30,001 was necessary for good government, which he was the one that wanted to reduce that number, what would they say about 735,000 to one today? So uh, these are big questions for us to, to look at as Americans and think about the application of the Bill of Rights, the size and scope of government, the powers of the general government. The Bill of Rights are essential in all of that. They're there to ensure that the central authority does not abuse these Anglo-American liberties that have been essential to uh, their conception of liberty for several hundred years when these Bill of Rights were finally uh, you know, added to the US Constitution. Thank you for that overview. That was fascinating. And um, I had always wondered about that amendment that, that would have affected the, the ratio on the congressional districts. And boy, to think about uh, 6,400 members of Congress, <laughs> if there were, if, if it was 50,000 to one, 
that uh, we think we've got bottlenecks now. I think that would be really uh, difficult to deal with. Um, but on the other hand, like you said, it would certainly make members of Congress probably even more responsive if they represented less people. I remember when I was chief of staff on the Hill back in the 80s, I think our ratio was was down like around 500,000 or so. Um, do you happen to know, does it, does it increase or how does that work? Well, in the early 20th century, the Congress locked in the House of Representatives at 435 members. So it doesn't really matter anymore how many people are in the United States. We're okay. just going to have 435 members. So we're going to see a situation not too distant future. We have a million to one. Um, and what's interesting about that is most of the states have a representative ratio much smaller than that. California is the largest. They have a very small legislature, actually, for the size of the state. But you have some states with a representative ratio of around 5,000 to one. I mean, it's so you've got this this idea of representative government and what that means. And I think this is interesting that Madison and, of course, Virginia ratified that Amendment 1. It was the first thing they, they ratified. Then, of course, Virginia became the key to ratifying all the Bill of Rights. But uh, they firmly believe that representative government had to be just that. You had to have a ratio that allowed for people to have contact with their legislators. And since you worked on the Hill, and I know I've spoken to other people, it's very hard even today to do that sometimes. I mean, you have uh, you have responses that are you know, computer generated and you know, there's, there's not even any contact. So I think this is why Americans get so angry and agitated with the central authority at the time. They don't feel like they have a voice and um, we see that politics have become, have become such a nasty game. It's really hard when you just don't feel like you're connected with those, with those legislators. Very true. Now, speaking of Virginia, we had had uh, one of our listeners had asked on a, a couple of episodes back if we could talk a little bit more on one of our chats about George Mason, mm -hmm. specifically in his role with the Bill of Rights. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, Mason, as I said in the beginning, uh, wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights. And George Mason is one of my favorite members of the founding generation. He's, he's great. Um, one of my other books is The Politically Incorrect, right, Incorrect Guide, if I can speak to the founding fathers. So um, I, I love George Mason. Uh, Mason was a retired, he, he preferred to be retired his entire life. He was a planter and he was only called out of retirement at certain times when he was needed. And George Washington was good friends with, with uh, George Mason. And during the period leading up to the American War for Independence, Mason played a pivotal role in Virginia. And then he did serve in various roles leading up to uh, what became the Declaration of Independence. And when Virginia left the union with the British, uh, they decided to write a constitution. And in that Mason was charged with writing or at least part of a committee that was charged with writing their declaration of rights. And that declaration of rights served not only as the basis of the Bill of Rights, but also Jefferson took some of the language of that for the Declaration of Independence. So George Mason was a pivotal figure in that period leading up to independence. And um, of course he went to the Philadelphia convention. Uh, George Mason was ardently against the uh, constitution. He was one of the two that refused to sign it. Um, in fact, uh, you know, he said he'd rather cut off his right hand. Um, and uh, the, the, the interesting thing, when, you, when this constitution goes then to the Virginia Ratification Convention, Mason again uh, opposes it there. And he writes a number of essays in opposition to the constitution, primarily focused on a lack of a Bill of Rights. Mason was concerned as someone who cherished these English liberties that that central government would abuse power. And he thought if we didn't have this protection, we would certainly uh, lose our liberties from this central authority. And uh, one of my favorite stories with George Mason, there was a couple of younger members of that Virginia ratifying convention who were joking around, this guy's gotten too old, uh, he's lost his wits. Well, this got to Mason and he went up to one of these members and he said, sir, when you lose your wits, no one will notice. And uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it's just great. Uh, but uh, Mason is, is just a fantastic character and deserve, deserves a, a statue, which he does have in Washington as the father of the Bill of Rights. I mean, he is one of those very important members of the founding generation. Again, not a household name. You hear his name, but not people don't know much about him. That is so important in this period of time. Well, thank you. Well, um, Tova, I want to loop you in here. I know you've I'm sure you've got some great questions to ask and uh, get you to be part of our discussion. Sure. So first of all, I find that discussion of um, of the ratio of representatives to people, that's so fascinating. Um, and I was wondering, 
when the it just made me think about how much easier it must have been for the founding fathers to be or the people in early government to be able to talk to people if there was a smaller ratio but I was wondering did they actually make use of this while uh, drafting the Bill of Rights did they actually uh, get out of their political bubble and uh, talk to everyday Americans when coming up with this legislation or did they mostly rely on like members of their same class or uh, social status group? That's a very good question. In fact, the Bill of Rights um, is an interesting experience, Amer experience, experiment, if I could speak again today, in American government, because it was a people's ratification. Um, you had properly elected conventions that, uh, of course, ratified the Constitution. And then those conventions were charged many times with coming up with drafts of what they wanted to see is added to the Constitution, changes they'd like to make. And all of those proposals were then sent on to Madison. So that ratification process led to the Bill of Rights. And that was certainly a, an effort by the people of the states. You had, if you look at the Federalist essays, for example, the, the object of that was to persuade not just the people voting for the Constitution, but the people of New York to support the document. And you saw this all over uh, the states, whether it was in Virginia, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, the Carolinas. I mean, you saw an active engagement of the uh, people of the states in looking at this constitution and seeing uh, what they liked, what they didn't like, um, and being vocal about it. And then, of course, the Bill of Rights were part of that process. So I, that's a great question. They, they certainly were interested in those who could participate in government at the time, voicing their opinion on the issue. That's great. Um, and just a more general question. I remember learning uh, in my history class about how the Bill of Rights has been used over time by a lot of different groups as kind of an inspiration for them to get equal rights under the law. Um, for example, it was used really heavily in abolition. Um, people really identified with it or women's rights, for example. So could you tell us a little bit, uh, if you could, about how different groups have used it as inspiration, even more so, I think, than the Constitution itself um, to gain their rights? Sure. Well, I mean, if you look at um, certain parts of the Bill of Rights, I think the one that people focus on the most is the First Amendment, uh, because the First Amendment is a heavy hitter. I mean, it really is. It provides the protections for speech, press, religion. I mean, those are the things that people are most concerned about. And if you don't have a free press, if you don't have free speech, if you don't have freedom of religion, well, you are curtailing much of what it means to be an American. Uh, whether you engage in religious activity or not, if you want to talk about the government positively or negatively, these are things that we should all be able to do. And this is why I think people get so upset about uh, the tech industry and things that are going on with that. Should we censor? Should we not censor? Should, how do we do these things? Uh, but when you look at your question about, you know, where, where is the influence? I think the influence has to even go back further than that. That's why I led off with that. You know, you look at the Magna Carta, you look at the English Bill of Rights, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, all those things. And of course, eventually the, the French adopted the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. And then you had these carried out throughout Europe and all over the world. People look to the American experiment as a as a symbol of this representative government and restricting the powers of a government. I mean, this is something that I think, again, we have to emphasize over and over again. The Bill of Rights are entitled, or, or, or the, the object of that is to restrict the power of a government. And so whether it's, you talk about an abolitionist group or a women's rights group, a lot of those groups also look to the Declaration of Independence for inspiration as well. But when you look to those, uh, to those amendments in these different groups throughout history, of course, they're going to find uh, the support for their positions. We have a right to speech. We have a right to religion. We have a right to these things that, uh, or whether it's, um, uh, you know, if you take the Fourth Amendment, you know, you know right to privacy. And these are issues that um, we, we talk about on a regular basis. So just about any civil liberties group in the United States has, uh, has their, traces their origin back to this discussion of what these Declaration of Rights mean for for Americans moving forward. Wow, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, and going back to the ratio idea, because I've just never heard this before. I'd never heard it laid out in those numbers. Um, has there been any interest since then about uh, efforts to decrease that ratio? Or is it kind of a, 
a conflict of interest because the people who would have the power to change that would be essentially diluting their power. And if politicians like one thing, we know what it is. <laughs> sure. Well, actually, it, it has several other states did ratify that amendment, but because it those ratifications took place later on, you still need more states to do it. You need 27 additional states to make that amendment part of the Constitution. Now, it's still hanging out there. We can still see that. But to answer your question, uh, Congress did enlarge the, the members of the House over time, but then that was capped in the early 20th century. Um, and so now we're stuck at 435 members. I, I don't I haven't seen much on this, uh, but you know, when we talk about the size and scope of government, uh, when you look at different issues like you know, we're talking about these things now, how much power should the states have? We just saw an election, hotly contested election, and this went back to the states. And uh, we, you know, we had the the uh, issue with Texas and 17 other states suing, and how all this worked out. Well, I mean, when you look at uh, these states and you start talking about people being engaged in these states themselves. I think this is where decentralization, which is what we're talking about, uh, has a role in, in future of American government. Young people like yourself questioning, you know, do I really have representative government in Washington? Where do, where do I have more power in my state and local government where I might know the mayor, I might know the city council, I might know my state representative, but yet it's very hard for me to have access to my member of Congress or my U.S. Senator even. We're seeing a, an election in Georgia that's become a national election. We've got you know, three uh, people or uh, four people, two races uh, in, in Georgia. And this has become a national issue. So do those people really represent the people or how does this all work? And, and uh, as far as, you know, carrying this forward, I think that this does need to be a discussion, um, but it hasn't been much of one because most people don't know it even exists. So they don't think about it um, on a regular basis. I often ask my students, if, if every form of government was to disappear tomorrow, which one would you miss first? If, and they they have to think about it for a minute, but you would miss your local government first. That's your police protection, your water, your trash pickup. These are things that you would would miss more than uh, the central government immediately. Right. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. I never thought about that, but that's a really good point. Um, and do you see the trend, as you mentioned, like our government has become much more centralized from what the original founding fathers had in mind. And do you see that trend of centralization continuing into the future? Or as you were mentioning, do you think we're gonna start to see a reversal of that? Because if I might just add, I've seen, I, I think it could go either way, but I think it's really interesting this year, I think has shown a lot of almost decentralization trends with coronavirus, how each state has such different policies. And with the election, states are now banding together against each other uh, to demand like different election results, which is a huge deal. So do you see like a, a decentralization or do you think that trend is just going to continue? That's a very good question. It'd be hard to predict because you're right. We've got on one hand, it really depends on who's in power, right? If, if the for the people on people on the right, if you know Trump's in power, they're much more interested in centralized power. If people on the, and the people on the left aren't, if if the people if Biden's in power, then the left is good with centralization, and the right isn't. So this is something that goes back and forth. But I do think that decentralization and, and what we're talking about is federalism. I mean, really, it's it's the coronavirus response, it's elections. Federalism is something that is on the is on the table. I think more than in the past because we are looking at issues that are such they're social and cultural issues you know if you if you look at a lot of the hot button topics these are social cultural issues and so they reflect the the communities in which they're applying to more than anything else and i think that's why you're seeing that uh because of the fact that you know if we're looking at um you know covid response well this community may not have a lot of covid cases but another community might so they might want to respond to that situation differently and federalism allows them to do that and i think that's something that's in the structure of government, of the US government, and we need to, to make that much more clear on a, on a regular basis. Well, and if I could jump in, because um, I know we were, we were talking about one of the two uh, original Bill of Rights that didn't pass, uh, the, represent, the, the one that dealt with representation in Congress. But then we also have the pay raise, uh, the compensation amendment that was part of the original Bill of Rights. It didn't pass when, when all the Bill of Rights passed. And just to be clear, because um, I, I, we may have some, some students who, who might not have picked up on this the first time, um, what we're talking about is that originally the Congress passed out 12 amendments and sent it to the states for ratification. 
but the states only ratified 10. So there were two that weren't ratified. And, you know, I was a political science major at Texas A&M University. And I hate to say that I never learned this until I was on a trip with Constituting America and the National Archives. And we were actually looking at the Bill of Rights. And we saw these two extra amendments. And, and we said, what are those? And, and someone said, well, those are two of the Bill of Rights amendments that, that didn't pass originally. But um, on the second amendment that didn't pass, the, the compensation of members of Congress that finally did pass, uh, I guess it was in the 1980s and is now our 27th amendment. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that amendment and um, if it, how many, if there were a lot of states that did ratify it at the time, but I guess just not enough. And do we know which states didn't ratify it? Right. Oh, and I, guess I have one other question as well. Sure. When they, when they made the effort and they were successful to finally ratify it uh, back in the 1980s. Did they use the, some of the state's votes that had taken place uh, back in 1791 as some of the ratification votes or did those states have to vote again on it? Right, okay, so this had to deal with congressional salaries. And in fact, it wasn't. It was uh, added to the constitution in 1992, I think. And it was, um, the funny story about that, it was that somebody going through the Bill of Rights just like you were and said, hey, what's this thing? <laughs> and it was a, it was a college student, I believe, or a graduate student that found this, and uh, they they made an issue out of it, and then it was they found that there was no expiration date on this amendment. See, amendments can have an expiration date. You, you if we pass came up with some amendment, Congress passed it, they can say this amendment will stay on the books until we get three quarters of the states, or it'll just sit there, or they can say this amendment has to be ratified by a certain date, or it 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 doesn't go into an effect. Now, seven states actually ratified this original Second Amendment, and they did use those as part of the ratification process in 1992. So um, it's interesting how you know, th that thing sat out there for, what, close to 200 years, uh, that um, you know, it, it, um, it wasn't ratified, but eventually it was. Uh, and the, the language is, um, uh, no law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall intervene. And essentially what this means is that Congress can't give themselves a pay raise. Uh, you know, I mean, they have to wait, right, till there's, a, till there's an election. Um, so it's, it's a great amendment because it doesn't allow these, the congressmen to sit there and just keep jacking up their salaries while, you know, I'm doing such a good job. Let me pat myself on the back and give myself more money. Um, so there has to be an election. It's um, and this was part of the founders' fear that we would get an oligarchy essentially in the government. That we would have a situation where you would have an artificial aristocracy created again. Uh, you there was a fear of a president being the exact same thing. But they were trying to curtail that and ensure that we would not have that situation because you would always have the people to intervene if Congress was getting out of hand. Well, great. Um, in talking about you know the, the how the states ratified the Bill of Rights, was it fairly quickly um, when the when it when they were presented out to the states from the Congress for ratification? How long did it take? Um, it took well. It started in, in 1789 and it took till 1791. So it took a couple of years. Um, New Jersey was the first to uh, to ratify uh, most of the amendments in 1789, and it took till 1791 with Virginia. So. The process was slow and there was a lot of debate about it. You know, do we need this? Do we not need these amendments? And this is what I mentioned before. There was this general fear that if we add the Bill of Rights, well, what you're saying is that the Constitution gives powers of the central government that we don't think it has. For example, the Congress, the Constitution doesn't give the Congress the power to abridge speech. It's not there. Mm. So if you follow James Wilson's logic, he would say, well, if it doesn't say they can do it, they can't do it then. But if you add a Bill of Rights and you say that the Congress can't do this, then, then by implication, you're saying that they actually could do this. So this is one of the, the important arguments against a Bill of Rights. And, and people had to debate this. You know, th Is that, are we creating a monster by putting a Bill of Rights at the end of the document? Or uh, are we in a situation where uh, we've, got, uh, we've got to curtail the powers of Congress because it could become abusive? And I think that's where that preamble that I read when we started this comes into play. They wanted to ensure that there would not be misconstruction that they would simply say that you don't, you can't do this. And the Ninth and Tenth Amendment again are key to all of that. The Ninth Amendment in particular, because it essentially says that you know even if we don't include all the liberties here, it doesn't mean the Congress has the ability to infringe on those liberties. So uh, it's it is a extreme check on the powers of the central government. 
Yeah, I found that preamble fascinating. Where can people find that if they want to read that? Sure, it's actually at archives.gov. Uh, if you just look up the National Archives and you look up just preamble to the Bill of Rights, uh, they list, uh, it's, it's a transcription of the Bill of Rights, including the preamble uh, and both the way that uh, it was sent out to the states and then what was finally agreed to by the states. Well, we've got some listener comments. Uh, Professor Klinger says that the British House of Commons has over 600 members and the UK is a much smaller country. And he also observes that the lower chamber of New Hampshire's legislature has 400 members and New Hampshire is a very small state. Right. So, Right, I mean, this is what I was saying. I think uh, New Hampshire is, I think it's around two or 3,000 to one for, for, their, uh, for the representative ratio. It's, we are in a situation in America, and if we just had a con an honest conversation about this, left and right, this is, not a, this is not a partisan issue. What kind of government do we want? Do we want uh, good representative government, or do we want government that's so aloof and detached from society, they get in the, inside the beltway? I mean, that's, you use these terms, but in reality, what we're talking about are people that don't seem to represent their constituents very well. You know, I know people on the right are very upset right now because this guy's not doing, or this lady's not doing what we want him to do. And then people on the left do the same thing. You know, these, these members are too old. They don't represent us anymore. Um, so what is going on here? And, and a lot of that has to do with disconnect between these groups because there's, it's very hard to have a conversation when you're looking at that kind of ratio, unless you have a lot of money and you can influence politics that way. Well, I guess if someone wanted to start a movement, they could use uh, Professor Klinger's points as, as arguments in their favor. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Danya Konki asks, how can we regain our First Amendment rights, which have been suppressed in 2020? Will 2021 be even worse? Do you have an opinion on that? Well, that's a good question. Um, of course, you know, litigation is always there. Uh, we, but, you know, it's hard when you talk about tech. And I think that's what people are looking at. It's the tech industry. And where do you go from there uh, when you have your major, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, all of those, and we all use them. I mean, I, I mean, everybody's on these things, and a lot of people have moved to other, other, uh, you know, software. But the fact is, um, those are such giant corporations, and then they restrict what can be seen, what can't be seen. So you're controlling the news. So one of the things, of course, you know, the Trump administration wanted to remove their their ability to not be sued for libel, which I'm not certain that's the way, but. Certainly litigation is there, but also, I mean, a general recognition that, you know, look, um, we have to start looking at these things from a much more local angle. I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we go about uh, talking about free speech and free press from a smaller, I mean, small is beautiful, that term small, we have, we have to start looking at these from, from a smaller scale. Um, but as far as your question, I don't know where we go from here. I mean, it's gonna have to be litigation in one way or another if we're gonna try to, to cut the power of these tech giants. And then uh, Sandy Thatcher asks about the Tenth Amendment uh, and, and asks of the Tenth Amendment in reference to states using their sovereign power at times to nullify ordinances from county and city governments and asks if that does not run counter to the Jeffersonian idea that the best government is that which is closest to the people. Well, that's an interesting uh, situation because when you look at states, um, states created the central authority. They also, by default, create the counties and the cities. And so because of that, uh, they have complete control, unless there is some legislation that's been written in the states themselves that give the counties and the cities some autonomy. But generally, they don't. They're corporate entities of the state. So, for example, if you have you know, state X and then you have city Y, and city Y is doing something that the state doesn't like, the state could simply revoke the, the charter of that city and that city could cease to exist. So that's an entirely different situation um, when it comes to states and then the relationship between the cities and counties. Um, that's much more difficult. Uh, now, when you look at the 10th Amendment, that applies, of course, to the central government. And uh, you know, if the central government is doing something that is unconstitutional, well, then there, the problem with the 10th Amendment, there's no teeth in it. The states don't really have any recourse other than we're going to try to sue or we're going to try to, we just won't follow that law. I mean, this is what the founders did. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that, but you know, in 1765, when we had the Stamp Act, uh, the founding generation just refused to enforce it. It's nullification is what that is. We're just not going to do it. And um, they did this over, over and over again, leading up to the American War for Independence. So 
if you have your local community just refuse to do it or county sheriffs, this has been talked about with gun control and other things. Well, the sheriffs just won't enforce that or mask mandates. We just won't enforce that. Well, essentially what you're doing is nullifying that law then. So um, this is this is another issue that I think is is a is a ripe issue for discussion in 2021. Well, and finally, Linda Bartlett asks if there are jobs that depend on the salary of members of Congress. And I, I think what she means by that, are there are there other positions whose pay is tied to whatever the current salary of members of Congress are, such as military generals or Supreme Court? No, that is something entirely separate. This is just members of Congress. Okay. Well, I'm going to hand it back over to Tova because I, I know Tova's got a few more questions and, and she has to get off right at... I believe 255 to get back to class. So Tova, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Yeah, I do have to get back to class, but this is much more interesting than calculus. So nobody tell my teacher. Well, I, just um, don't ask me a calculus question. I won't be able to answer that, so. We're good. The founding fathers <laughs> didn't, didn't deal with calculus, so we don't, we don't have to do either. Um, and so I was wondering what exactly was the breakdown of which founding fathers were for and against the inclusion of the Bill of Rights? And then did these differences break down along any lines like Northern Southern or, you know, I don't know, French sympathies and English sympathies or like any any sort of lines that were back then? Well, uh, you found opposition all throughout the states and you found support all throughout the states. So um, generally those that initially favored the ratification of the constitution were against a bill of rights. And you find the most vocal supporters of that position being men like Alexander Hamilton or James Wilson of Pennsylvania or Roger Sherman of, uh, of Connecticut, Roger Sherman, the old Atlas, another one of my favorite members of the founding generation so, of course, those members being from the North and the Mid-Atlantic states, but you also found individuals who were against the Bill of Rights in the South as well. So uh, it wasn't necessarily sectional. Um, it wasn't based on class. These are people that either supported the document or were against it. That's generally the breakdown that you had initially uh, in this period of time leading up to ratification. And then you mentioned that the, you know, people of America were pretty, like, involved in uh, the, you know, had a say in what was included. And so, you know, in terms of opinions at the time in America, is there any information as to whether the majority of people supported or opposed this uh, inclusion of the Bill of Rights? I think that the, uh, if you look at the ratification of the Constitution, how close it was in many states, I mean, you're talking about New York, for example, three votes. Uh, in Massachusetts, I can't remember the exact number, but it was very, very close. Virginia, it's close. I mean, you're, in your large states, it was very close. Uh, Pennsylvania seemed like a big gap, but it really wasn't because Pennsylvania was doing some shady things uh, during this time. But uh, generally, I think the American public, the people of the states, were in favor of some type of Bill of Rights uh, because you wouldn't have seen a ratification of the Constitution without it. You know, remember North Carolina and Rhode Island. First of all, Rhode Island... Uh, <laughs> didn't ratify the document until 1791, North Carolina until 1789. And this was hotly contested in North Carolina. So without a Bill of Rights, neither one of those states is going to ratify the Constitution. Um, and then Massachusetts wouldn't have done it. I think that uh, you had some pretty vocal opponents of the Constitution in New York. I mean, three votes, that's all it gets in favor of the Constitution. Virginia, you had some powerhouses in Virginia, Patrick Henry among them, who were opposing this thing. So um, overall, I would say the, the general majority of the American public, if you could measure it that way, the people of the states were in favor of a Bill of Rights. Am I correct that James Madison originally sort of opposed the idea of a Bill of Rights and then changed his mind? Have you, had you said that earlier? or um... No, I hadn't. But this is the general position of the proponents of the document. Again, because they thought that if you include a Bill of Rights, you're actually codifying a loose interpretation of the Constitution. You were saying that these powers would be there that we're saying are not there. So you don't need it. It's unnecessary. Uh, and that's that's the the State House Yard speech by, speech by James Wilson uh, in October of 1787 is a speech that everyone should look at for original interpretation of the document because he makes this clear. He says, look, um, there's a fear that we're going to centralize power. We're not going to do that. And that the government's going to have all these powers that are not included in the Constitution. They can't because this is a different kind of government than what we have at the state level. So um, that was the initial thrust going forward that we don't need a Bill of Rights because this thing is so limited in scope and it's so general. You're not going to need that stuff. 
But as these ratification debates heated up and as you had George Mason go on the offensive and everyone was responding to George Mason, you had an old Whig in Pennsylvania and Brutus, you had these people writing these very powerful essays against the Constitution. They had to take it into consideration and eventually they capitulated and said, okay, we'll give you a Bill of Rights if you'll just ratify the document. Do you have much information on the 17 amendments that uh, originally were in Congress, the ones that I guess there were... If 12 came out, then there must have been five that didn't make it out. Do you know what any of those dealt with that, that never made it out to the states? Well, um, <laughs> some of this actually had to do with kind of a, a preamble that, uh, that uh, Madison was looking to add. And it was you know, the right of uh, the people to change their government, for example. I mean, these are some of the things that people were, that they were talking about. Some of the, the, the there were hundreds, though, that actually came into the uh into the into the congress and in my founding father's guide to the constitution i include some of those and some of them are interesting uh one for example that came out of of new york uh, i'm sorry came out of virginia would have um prohibited what were called navigation laws and uh navigation law of course is a tariff and so the <laughs> a protective tariff so um, this was virginia was showing its hand already that there was going to be some economic conflict moving forward that they were concerned about um, the, the carrying states, whether it's mid-Atlantic states or New England, putting tariffs, slapping tariffs on the South, which would, of course, in their mind, have hurt the South more than the North. So um, you had some very localized amendments coming out of this, um, things that were sectional. And I think that's why they were ultimately rejected, because they, it was thought, well, these are just going to be a sectional amendment, it really doesn't apply to the whole. Um, but there were some interesting amendments like that. And and uh, I think that's fascinating when you look at, you know, how these people were thinking about long term, some of the things that we that were issues later on, you know, years and years later on, that would become problematic. They were already thinking about amendments and how they could curtail that and, and solve that problem. And here's a question from Michael Amowitz, and I, I don't know if you'll know the answer, but he is asking how many amendments are actively waiting in the wings? Do we have any idea how many amendments are just out there waiting for the <laughs> states to ratify them? I don't know. I mean, there was a big deal made about the ERA recently, um, but that was just that was almost silly in a way because that amendment had a, had an expiration date. So even though some states ratified the ERA after the fact, um, it really didn't matter that that amendment had to be ratified by a certain time. Uh, this is a difficult process. It's one of the things that uh, was often criticized that, you know, to get an amendment to the Constitution, there's only 27. There's a reason for that. It's hard to do. It's hard to amend the Constitution. You have to have a large a supermajority in the Congress, and then you have to have 75% of the states to do it. Or you can have a state convention, uh, state conventions amend it. There is, of course, the uh, call for what's called the convention of the states. People are talking about calling other convention states to, do, to, to address amendments and try to create some, some discussion about this. And there are a number of states who have signed on to this process. Uh, the late Phyllis Schlafly used to be so much against this because she thought, you know, that would lead to a runaway convention. Um, I tend to like the idea of a convention of states because I think there are some things that we could see that would be beneficial for the Constitution, of course, limiting power moving forward. But um, that's, I think, that what people are looking at now. I mean, the, of course, the original First Amendment is still hanging around out there if people wanted to ratify it. So, uh, But I don't know about any others. Now, speaking of the First Amendment, Dwayne Horner, who is our sponsor for this uh, segment of Constitutional Chats, and thank you again, Dwayne. Dwayne writes in, if the press has a constitutional protection, don't they also have a fairness obligation? Well, um, I would say no. I mean, if you look at, uh, and what do you mean by fair? You know, you look at the early press, it was free, but it was never very fair. Look, uh, when you when you talk about Thomas Jefferson, for example, the man was paying people to write negative things about John Adams. Uh, and while he's sitting in government, he's doing it. So and Abigail Adams knew it, which is why she wouldn't let any of his letters go to John Adams at one point. So we had extremely partisan presses. And I think that that's actually OK. Um, and I say that because if we just knew who were behind these partisan presses, you know, whether if it used to be, well, this is the Federalist newspaper. This is the Democratic Republican newspaper. People knew it from the beginning. And so in that way, you would know which one you wanted to read or which one you didn't want to read based on who owned the thing. Um, but now we have this idea, this veil of objectivity. 
CNN is supposed to be objective. We know it's not, but a lot of Americans don't really pay much attention to that. It's, well, CNN's on, I'll just watch that, or Fox News or whatever's on. They just don't care. Um, and so that objectivity, that veil of objectivity, now, that really started coming out when you saw television, because you had the big three networks, and you had Walter Cronkite, and you had the, the news anchors, and they were supposed to be objective, just give you the news. We all know that's not the case. We all know there's bias in that. Um, so fairness is hard to measure. We need free. And I think right now, that's the issue. It's not necessarily free when you have Twitter locking down the New York Post before the election, because the New York Post dares to say something negative about uh, the Bidens. And they say, you can't you can't put that on our on our network. Well, that's the issue more than just fairness. I think that Americans, if they had access to the information, could make up their own mind and decide what's right and what's not right. Well, thank you for that. We are almost out of time, and this has just been fascinating. And we thank you so much for being with us on Bill of Rights Day. And do you just have any parting or summary comments for us about the Bill of Rights as a whole and um, the importance of it and, and where we go from here going forward? Sure. Well, I think it's important. As I said at the beginning, the Bill of Rights are important, and we have to remember that they curtail the powers of the central government. I also encourage people to look at your state constitutions because so often people go right to the U.S. Constitution when they want to contest a state law. And your state, all of the states have Bill of Rights as well. I mean, this is such an important part of the American political tradition to have protections for civil liberties in the states and for the general government. So uh, you know, for example, if we're talking about you know gun rights, virtually every state in the United States has some kind of protection for gun rights, um, and that's that's a big issue for a lot of people. Uh, religion, you know, freedom of religion, that's a big issue. How these things are 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 written in these state constitutions is important. Look at your state constitutions as well, and if there are problems in those, try to actively change that. Don't just focus necessarily on the U.S. Bill of Rights. But if we're talking about Bill of Rights Day. Let's talk about the Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights, these state constitutions that have Bill of Rights. The U.S. Constitution has a Bill of Rights. This is really is the American tradition, and I think it's important for people to understand that. Well, thank you. And we thank you so much for your time and, and all you brought to our program today. And we want to wish everybody who was with us today a very happy Bill of Rights Day. We want to thank again Dwayne Horner for sponsoring our program. And we want to encourage you to go on our website and sign up for our 2021 uh, constitutional chats. Our next one will be, this will be the last one for this year. Our next one will be Tuesday, January 5th, and we'll continue every Tuesday after that at 2 p.m. Eastern. So thank you very much for being with us. And thank you, Brian. Um, we really, really appreciate all you do with Constituting America. I appreciate it too. And again, use that coupon code BOR DAY if you want to get. 40% uh, off my American Constitutions course. So it's a great class. I go through a lot of this stuff too. So uh, I'd love to see you all there and taking that course.